Um, today we're looking at automated decision making in migration and um, the word migration services has come about partly because this is this event is part of the social services uh, um, focus area of the centre um, but it really is about migration more broadly rather than just services and it connects very nicely with mobilities. So my name is Paul Henman um, and I'm based at the University of Queensland and I'll be chairing today's session. Oh. Um, so first of all, I want to begin by acknowledging traditional owners, uh, wherever we are situated in, uh, in here in um, Sydney University uh, Law School, we are in Gadigal country, um, Gadigal people and the Kula Nation. Um, so I want to acknowledge those, those traditional people. We acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging and recognising the importance of cultural connection and uh, mobilities, but also uh, places of learning um, and knowledge. So this particular event is actually uh, an outcome, a fourth of two particular types, similar events, where we've started to try to I'd ask, ask where is automated decision-making occurring in different social services? So our first one we did um, was on um, child and family services. So where is automated decision-making child, in child and family services? The second one was on social security and employment. The third one was in disability services. And today we're looking at migration. Um, and all of these, these events have been um, recorded uh, and made available on the YouTube ch channel of the center uh, and also into podcasts. So with all the permission from our speakers today, um, we will be hoping plans to do that. So the intention of these events is to try to bring together researchers that have been doing research about automation in, in areas of migration and migration experiences and policy and, and both positive and negative, and also people working in the field that will, in this case, uh, uh, migration and refugee law, uh, migration and settlement services, et cetera, to try to say, okay, what's happening, but what should we know? What are the concerns that we may face? But also what should we be investigating in the future? So today I wanna to start with giving a panel. We've got like a number of online um, contributors and we've got a number of in-person contributors. So running a hybrid event is really great. Then sometimes it can be a bit difficult. So we hope that if you are those online, have questions, please put them into the chat or raise your hand and our tech support will hi highlight that to, to me. So the, we'll start with thinking and looking out about 10 minute presentations from each of our speakers in terms of looking out what are the research work that people have done. Um, I wanna first introduce you to all of our speakers. So we have Professor, Professor Heather Horst, who is from the WSU, Western Sydney University, and is a Chief Investigator of the Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society. She's also the Director of the Institute of Culture and Society at Western Sydney University. She's a sociocultural anthropologist and has done a number of research projects looking at the way in which digital technology is used in, um, in, with migra migrants and migrant experiences. Um, and she'll be talking today about some reflections on that. We also have Dr. Louis Everest from the University of South Australia. Uh, and Louis is a research associate, associate and coordinate, coordinate, coordinator. It's just too late in the day, isn't it, really? At the University of South Australia and the Jean Monnet Centre of Excellence, where he also teaches uh, across the sociology program. Dr. Everest's primary research interests are located in the sociological study of mobilities sovereignty, migration, globalization, and climate change. And today he'll talk about his research, recent research on border and border controls. We also have Associate Professor Daniel Jezebash, who is at the University of New South Wales. And he is an Associate Professor and Deputy Director of the Calder Centre for International Refugee Law and the lead, to, lead of the Access to Justice and Technology Stream at the UNSW Allen's Hub of Technology, Law and Innovation. Um, he's, he's a holder of a DECRA project um, and which examines fast track asylum policies and whether it is possible to design procedures which are both fair and efficient. And Daniel 
works uh, connects the connection connects the worlds of academia um, and legal practice uh, in his work. And lastly, we have joining us um, at, from the early hours in the UK, Dr. Tuba Birkan. Um, and she's based in the UK, but also in Brussels, and she is an assistant professor of sociology, uh, is a proud migrant who has worked and lived in Turkey, Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands. Her scholarly interests cover a wide range from, from public perceptions and attitudes towards new technologies, ethics and transparent uh, and trustworthy AI, the use of governance and big data for AI for global challenges um, to the diversity of migration, gender inequalities, equal opportunities and social and public policies. So um, I'll introduce this panel uh, first and then we will turn to the speakers who are speaking from the field, uh, who have their very practice experience in talking about where they see digital technologies coming into their own practice and what the challenges that are. So I'm going to, we slip the slides around. Um, we start with uh, Louis um, and I'll um, welcome you to the lectern. Thank you. So uh, yes, my research looks a lot at sovereign borders and the construction of sovereign borders and how that process is involved in the creation of political communities and their outsiders. Although recently, I've been looking a lot at how digital technologies are being incorporated into sovereign borders and how that's changing the nature of sovereignty and the way we produce political communities. Within that uh, context, uh, I've looked at the way automated decision making or ADM is being used in sovereign borders. And in this presentation, I'm really going to do two things. Firstly, I'm going to give a bit of a summary on some of the key ways that automated decision making is deployed in constructing a sovereign border, the border of a nation state. And then I'm going to bombard you of acronyms and examples until my 10 minutes is up and we'll see how far through we get. So how is ADM used in the construction of sovereign borders? Well, there are a number of key moments where automated decision making, the use of a computer system to be involved in some form of administrative decision is deployed into the performance of the border, the establishment of whether someone can enter a political community or must remain outside. One of those moments is in assessing visa applications and visa waiver applications. The initial application someone submits to request authority to travel towards a certain nation state. Then there's the screening process that occurs as someone's on the move, uh, often referred to as advanced passenger processing. There are multiple moments when someone can have a risk assessment score produced about them or can be matched against databases during that process. It can result in someone being unable to board a flight in a in overseas airport or being intercepted in immigration and uh, subject to further the tests or assessment by immigration officials. Then there's post-travel assessment. As borders are digitised, we are increasingly followed by borders after we cross thresholds. Uh, an example of this is a photo on the bottom right there of the Amiga Boris smart camera system in the Netherlands, where there are cameras that monitor cars and assess whether those cars are likely to be involved in illegal migration or other things. In a sense, it's a bordering process. Judgments are being made about the occupants of vehicles based on certain characteristics, and it's a largely automated process, although whether officers act upon Amigo Boris decisions is another matter. And then finally, there's a kind of spatial monitoring aspect to, to ADM at the border, where say along the US-Mexico border, where there are smart cameras set up to monitor spaces and try and identify subjects who could be subject to a sovereign decision. Now across these processes, and particularly the ones I'll talk about today, ADM relies on the construction of two types of digital identity. It relies on the construction of a data double about a person because a computer system can never really know a human being. All it can ever really know is a set of characteristics that we code about a human being. What we choose to define as important about them and represent about them to a computer-based system that can be involved in an ADM process. That's someone's data double. The process may stop with a data double if the ADM system's purely matching that data double against databases but if it's generating a risk assessment score, if it's categorizing someone's data double as threatening or safe or dangerous or whatever, then it has to construct another identity, a normative identity, a comparative identity. 
and that's essentially how pretty much every risk profiling system works. The creation of these two identities and then comparing them to one another. Now, how many acronyms can I get through? In the European Union at the moment, it's a pretty, I suppose, exciting time for ADM because they're in the process of rolling out a, quite a few new systems. We've got the entry exit system that's going to replace passport stamping for travellers on short visits to the Schengen region. And along with that, we've got the uh, European Travel Information and Authorisation System, or EDIUS, which is what Australians and people who are eligible for visa waivers for short-term stays in the EU will apply for. Both these systems involve some degree of ADM, but particularly EDIUS involves, and this is uh, quoted from the EDIUS regulation, algorithm-enabled profiling that points to security, illegal immigration, or high uh, epidemic risks. Essentially, EDIUS will set up a bunch of risk profiles and when we apply to go to Europe, we'll have a data double constructed. That data double will be compared against the risk profiles and we'll get a risk assessment score based on that. It'll be a largely automated process, although in the regulation it does say that a human being will have to make the final decision within the EDIUS framework. Both these systems have been delayed a number of times now. <laughs> I think they're due for rollout in mid-24, but I wouldn't necessarily be holding my breath. However, the EU does already have a number of systems that incorporate ADM already in play. One of them is the Shenzhen uh, Information System, which is the biggest criminal and migration database and contains alerts on people. An alert could be based on someone breaching visa conditions in the past. Uh, the ADM process with SIS isn't necessarily the most nuanced because when someone applies for a visa, a member state has to search the um, CIS uh, database and if they've previously breached a visa condition, they're kind of automatically disqualified. So it's a pretty basic ADM process. However, the visa information system, or VIS, was amended in 2022 to once again have a risk profiling aspect to it. So that is a more advanced ADM system that involves an algorithmic risk profiling system. And uh, the factors that are contributed to the normative identity with VIS uh, partly developed by member states and member state threat assessment. So there's kind of a broad range of factors that could be put into a normative profile for the risk assessment in VIS. Now, I'm going to move on to Australia, but it's important to know that in the EU, they are pushing ahead with continuing to incorporate ADM into a variety of different systems at the border. Uh, there's been draft council conclusions that have really pushed member states to not only improve their systems for doing these sorts of ADM style bordering in airports, but to increase their ability to border people on the move. Mobile fingerprint scanners and the various legislation that allows police to perform the role of the border guard in their normal criminal duties. Some people would describe this as crimmigration or the conflation of criminal policing and uh, the process of bordering. Australia. It's much harder for me to give a neat summary of the key systems that the Australian government deploys in a similar way as the EU, because unlike the EU where the key systems are legislated, almost down to the characteristics that can be incorporated into the normative identities that are used to construct risk scores, in Australia, instead of that, the uh, ADM bordering systems are largely treated as part of the executive prerogative. There's a section in the Migration Act that some of you may be aware of, which is all important here, section 495A, which gives the minister the ability to delegate pretty much any of their responsibilities to a computer system. Some of the responsibilities under the Act is automatically given the right for the minister to delegate in that section. And some of the minister's responsibility, the minister has to pass a um, regulation, a, a legislative instrument to be able to delegate. But essentially, the minister can delegate pretty much anything. And a computer system that has been delegated in this fashion, when that computer system makes a decision, it is taken to be a decision of the minister. And section 495B uh, clearly articulates that the minister has no responsibility to review those decisions. So they are, they're pretty final in our system of uh, government where the immigration minister has a huge amount of power over bordering matters. Now I'm just going to cover a few things here. Even though 
the, the systems in Australia aren't necessarily legislated, so they're not overtly available for us to examine in the same way as the EU. Uh, freedom of information requests of both the legislative instruments that are used by the minister to delegate authority to systems and also the um, procedural manuals for the um, uh, Department of Immigration and Border Protection that advise people working in the industry of how to do their job also provide clues and hints to how ADM is being deployed. For instance, we know that smart gates can pretty much autonomously grant visas to New Zealand citizens. We also know that smart gates can do the entire automated immigration clearance process and from a, a procedural instruction, we know that that process involves matching people to risk profiles, comparing their data doubles to normative identities. We also know that Australia carries out advanced passenger processing, which involves multiple stages of risk assessment of travellers as they move towards Australia. Once again, we can get this from some of the procedural instructions that are given to um, immigration officers. And um, a wonderful piece of research in 2015 they uncovered the specific system that's used to give risk assessment scores to travellers, at least at that time, um, which was the border risk identification system. And the final way that we uh, roll out ADM uh, processes in our bordering mechanisms that I'll just touch upon, because I believe other panellists will probably cover this as well, is through the way we assess visa applications. We have an auto grant process where computer systems entirely manage the visa assessment process. And one thing the government says as a sort of safety mechanism is that an entire ADM process will only be used for positive outcomes on visas. But what that doesn't tell us is the extent to which a negative risk score uh, motivates a visa processing officer just to press an I agree button. <laughs> <laughs> and essentially the question then is how automated is that process? And I'll finish with one reflection because I'm already over time, and that is that there are some key takeaways in comparing these two contexts. And those takeaways, for me, go to the heart of ADM at the border and ADM more generally, and that is how it's embedded. If we think about the theoretical tradition of science and technology studies, so much about a technology is produced by the way it's embedded. And there's a fundamental difference between embedding ADM in legislative frameworks, where there's a degree of transparency, or embedding it in executive uh, privilege and where there's no degree of transparency. And there are a lot of other conclusions we can reach from comparing those two contexts. But I'm over time already, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Louis. That was a really great place to start about the questions about borders and uh, and also the different dimensions of that. So um, we will now move on to our second speaker, um, Associate Professor Dr. Uh, Daniel Jezelbash. Je Je um, thank you very much. Thank and you. I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, and I think um, my presentation builds on very nicely from yours, Louis. I think I'm going to zoom in to um, one of the areas that, that, that Louis talked about, which was the use of automated systems in processing visas, um, looking particularly in Australia, uh, and then maybe unpacking a little bit further some of the ideas you posed at the end there about regulation and what that could look like in Australia. Um, and I should start by, I guess, a confession, um, which is that generally I am very much a techno-optimist, and my work... My research hasn't been so much specifically on, on automated decision making, but um, various contexts in which um, lawyers and users of the legal system can leverage technology to increase access to justice. And um, I also run the Caldor Center Data Lab, where we use um, AI and, and other technologies to scrape data from publicly available um, documents to, to build a kind of dashboard on how tribunal members and judges are deciding refugee cases. And um, one of the, I guess, the findings from that is that uh, you know, there's a huge degree of variability uh, in the way humans reach decisions. And you know, in that context, I guess the, the promises of ADM can, can be alluring. And so yeah, um, you know, with the right, if used appropriately and in 
used in the right context, um, you know, it can lead to a, a, a fairer and more efficient migration system. Um, but you know, for that to happen, we need to have adequate safeguards in place. And there, as Louis mentioned, there's nothing in place in, in terms of binding regulation. And um, I'll, I'll be drawing on the principles of administrative justice to sketch out um, you know, maybe some guiding principles that can um, you know, be used to chart the course towards better regulation in this space. So Louis already done a great intro on sort of the current state of play in Australia. We've got this extraordinary provision um, that is just so broad in terms of the powers that it gives, that allows to be delegated for automatic decision making. And we really don't know the full extent um, and where this power is being used. Even looking at your notes, it seems to be a little bit different, but like a few different areas from what I have. We really have to piece together through freedom of information requests and passing mentions in policy documents um, to try and get a picture. Um, but the areas where it is used now, as Louis said, it's an it's an auto grant process. Um, it seems to be they seem to be targeting sort of high volume visa subcategories um, and ones that have relatively straightforward criteria to apply. But as I'll discuss a bit more further, there's still you know, these evaluative judgments being made by whatever these systems are. And we have no idea how these judgments are actually being made right now. In terms of where we're headed, uh, I think we've been getting mixed signals in recent years. So not that long ago, 2017, 2018, the department was like 100% all in on automated decision making. They went to tender to get private corporations to build this new global migration platform with ADM at the centerpiece. Uh, but interestingly, if you have a look at the new, the very recent review into Australia's migration system, there's barely any mention of ADM at all, which I think uh, may reflect a, a new, more cautious approach, um, perhaps being undertaken in the backdrop of you know, the, the fallout from robo debt, uh, but uh, which I think this cautious approach is a welcome one. Um, but I'm sure we're going to be seeing more movement in the space going forward. And I think we need to get the right regulation and the right safeguards in place. And this, this concept of using administrative law, the principles of, of administrative justice to guide that uh, is not a new one. And way back in 2004, the Australian um, so Administrative Review Council um, had published a report on I'm just trying to think of the exact wording. It was assisted decision making um, in general, and so they called for this. You know, these these, these foundational principles of administrative law could be used to guide regulation, and they did have quite prescriptive um, suggestions, which I think are still relevant today, coming out of that. Um, but I'm just going to jump on or highlight a few key, sort of key areas. And you know, the most basic, and it might seem really obvious to say, is this idea of lawfulness. You know, the the code and the, uh, whatever the algorithm is that you're using needs to reflect the law and policy as it's, uh, in an accurate way. And you know, this is very challenging in the migration space in particular. It's the most, one of the most complicated, uh, intricate, and like longest pieces of legislation that we have. And it also changes very often. So um, you don't, uh, we shouldn't underestimate this, uh, the difficulty of meeting this very basic requirement of lawfulness. And you don't have to look any further than the sort of robo debt debacle to see what happens when you devise a, a, a system that ha has an erroneous view of what the law is. So the second principle I want to mention is fairness, and there are a lot of different components to this uh, to unpack, but I think just a couple that I think are particularly relevant in this context. Um, the first is the type of decision that's being automated, and while it may be relatively straightforward for uh, to automate systems which apply sort of objective criteria to establish facts. That is very rarely the case in any area of migration decision making. And there's you know, generally at least some level of evaluative judgment taking place and quite often very broad disc discretion being taken, taken place. And you know, even going back to the list that I put up before of those areas, you'll see that you know, the there's like a, this requirement to be a genuine visitor to Australia across a lot of those. And it, it involves weighing up a whole bunch of subjective evidentiary evidence that could point either way. And there's, right now we have no transparency around you know, how that is being 
assessed in the current system. Um, and this becomes even more important going forward where we've, we've, systems are going to be making much more complex discretionary decisions. The second point I want to make about fairness is the issue of bias. And I think my starting point here, I think I should mention, is that humans are not particularly good decision makers. And that I think it's pretty well accepted that all human decision making is subject to social and cognitive biases. Um, and you know, as I mentioned before, in that context, you know, ADM is a little bit alluring for me because you know, maybe it would be a way to kind of counteract some of those biases. But um, I think I'll leave it to other experts in the room as to whether that is possible. But I think in the short term, the risks are that those, all it does, it further perpetuates those biases, either in the programming stage or in the training on historical data and decision making. And whether it's possible to overcome that or not, I don't have the technical expertise to answer, but I'd welcome a discussion on. And I think that Louis really focused on this a lot, uh, rightly, and I think this is probably some of the most important and, and lacking um, areas which we're lacking in right now in terms of regulation is this idea of these values of transparency and accountability. We have no idea where ADM is being used. An, in, an individual is, often isn't told that an, 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 an ADM has been used to decide their case. And beyond knowing that you're being subject to an automated decision, you also you know, need to be transparent around how these decisions are being made. What, what, are the, what, what is the code? What are, what are the algorithms? What is the data that they've, been, that they've been trained on? And also getting intelligible answers, so reasons for a decision. And you know, those three components are all absolutely essential for accountability, both for public scrutiny of these systems, but also to allow for meaningful access to merits and judicial review. And you know, none of this stuff that I'm talking about today is new or, or groundbreaking. As I've said, there's far more detailed sort of soft law guidance already available out there in Australia. Um, beyond that Australian research, Australia Administrative Review Council um, paper I mentioned, um, that led to the development of the Commonwealth Ombudsman's Automated Decision Making Better Practice Guide. Um, you've got the Australian AI ethics principles, and you had the Australian Human Rights Commission um, Human Rights and Technology Report in 2021 with detailed recommendations in this space. The problem is there's nothing binding. It's all soft law guidance, and uh, I think there is, I think most people agree that there, there, is, a, there is a need for binding um, regulation in this space, and there is movement happening in that space. So you've got the the Digital Technology Task Force recently ran a consultation around positioning Australia as a leader in digital economy regulation, and they're yet to hand down their report, but it's widely anticip generally anticipated that there'll be recommendations there um, to, in, in terms of yeah, moving forward the regulatory piece. There's some really great submissions if you're interested in like the, to get into the weeds of possible models. Um, the Law Council of Australia has a really detailed um, some really detailed um, and excellent ideas that you can look at. Um, but it was also touched on in the report of the um, Robo Debt Royal Commission handed down last week. And I won't go into it in detail because I've hit time, but at a very high level, the suggestions there were that there's uh, legislative amendments to establish standards for which decisions should be automated and which should not, and appropriately designed systems for transparency, review, and appeal. Um, so I think the ideas are all there. It's just about a matter of political will to make it happen now. Thank you. I'm going to call on our last speaker for the first part of our session, um, Professor Heather Horse. So I'll pass it on to you. Okay, um, so it was really great. Um, I mean, first of all, thank you to Paul and I thank Ivana for inviting me to be on this uh, panel. Um, I have to co confess that I asked why because I actually haven't done research specifically on ADM and migration in the um, currently, but it's something that we've been kind of thinking about um, as part of the Center of Excellence. But it also, um, 
uh, is connected to previous work that I've done um, both with kind of uh, Windrush generation return migrants, Haitian migrants on the border of Dominican Republic and Haiti, migrants, um, largely Asian migrants, uh, coming into um, cities like Melbourne and their kind of the maintenance of kind of transnational connections, and also a lot of the work that I've been doing more recently with Fijians um, who move through uh, sites from, uh, you know, Australia to New Zealand to London to the US, etc. And so migration has kind of been part and parcel of what I've done, but I'm kind of, so I'm trying to use that experience to kind of ask questions about um, the kind of way that we might think about um, ADM and migration uh, from, I think, um, one of the, the roles that I have in this, this center is being the kind of co-lead of the people program. And so that's the kind of core of that. Um, what happens really, what I want to ask today is um, how are people actually making and experiencing automated decision processes and how are differently positioned people, um, migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, not the same categories of people at all, not the same experiences, how are they differentially experiencing these processes? So that's kind of the core question that I just want to kind of throw out today. Um, I think as you've heard from the fantastic presentations, I mean, I'm learning, I feel I have notes all over the place, I'm learning so much. Um, but I think one of the things that's really, was really clear to me when I started looking at the ADM and migration literature is how much it's focused either on the systems, the technological systems that are kind of trying to underpin it and trying to think about things like how to link up data as we just heard, um, you know, what are the ethics around that, um, how do you actually do it <laughs> logistically, um, but then a, a huge raft of research on kind of institutional and policy um, sort of issues, which, you know, is connected to Paul, obviously Paul's, you know, social services uh, expertise. But uh, so a lot of it is, is much more about the kind of processes and the, and the kind of systems and how are, you know, what's happening here and quite necessarily so. But there's very, very little on actually how people who are using these systems, either the people who are um, whose decisions are being amplified, uh, you know, like the border control agents, you know, whether or not that decision to tick yes or no, I agree, you know, their experiences, but also the people who are actually applying, using, and asking um, information about these systems. And so I think it's quite important. Um, I mean, there's, there's lots of things that are really important about this moment about understanding the systems, but I think we also need to start looking at the people who are actually using the systems. I'm really starting to ask kind of what is at stake and for whom. And so this, I took this um, from a kind of report, this migration strategy group report. There's a series of these that are kind of published online with, you know, kind of thinking about the big issues, looking, you know, the international, uh, you know, organization, migration states, martial states, et cetera. There's a range of people um, who are, um, and organizations who are weighing in on this, but really a kind of missing voice is that experience of the actual migrant. Um, so I've, I kind of have two real kind of points here that really draw upon that previous work that I d have done on migration, and it's really about the kind of the relationship between ADM and the migration encounter, and really thinking about um, what is sort of possible. So just to kind of step you back into some of the kind of research that I do, um, you know, over the years we've kind of moved from a point where you know the way, main way that migrants received information and, and had kind of were able to kind of communicate and learn about the kind of infrastructures of migration was either going in person or eventually kind of using the mobile phone. And so the mobile phone, um, it really became a kind of pivotal object in a lot of migrants' journeys um, in the Caribbean, certainly where I was kind of working. And there were lots of things where they had the kind of capacity to um, carry information, um, not always, you know, and, and find out information or coordinate uh, getting further information. But there's a, lots of questions about whether or not it's the right or most relevant um, uh, information. Um, alongside that, um, and the kind of, you know, looking at that came a question about the cost of actually staying in touch, finding information, um, relying how they get access to services is a kind of key thing. How do they continue that access when they move across borders? You know, one my, one this has become easier, and certainly in the EU it's much easier, but as you move across different states, 
there's a whole sort of infrastructure behind that. And I think there's a range of things that I can kind of talk about here. Um, what I wanted to kind of just highlight here, and this is my one image, usually I have more, um, is this sort of image here. Um, we did some work with migrants moving across the border of Haiti and the Dominican Republic and asked them kind of what do you carry across the, the border. Now this is a place that um, this particular area that we were working in, the border opens and closes every day and night. Um, Haitian migrants often could move back and forth, had families, jobs or whatever in the Dominican Republic but had to be back in Haiti by like 6 p.m. at night. They were often, you know, asked to produce documents, state IDs or whatever by kind of border officials. Um, and one of the things we did is ask them kind of what are the objects that you carry with them? Because you really can only, it's not like they could carry big suitcases. They were carrying it on their person. And these were some of the most kind of common items. So you can see, you know, a very basic mobile phone and SIM cards. Some people had SIM cards that worked across the border. Some people uh, did not. They had to get different SIM cards. Um, you can see the sort of national ID. You can see a kind of notebook for keeping information, a pen, a key to their house, and a Bible. <laughs> and those were the kind of a typical sort of set of portable kit items that someone who's sort of moving across the border on a regular basis sort of has with them. Um, and so you can sort of see it's a small amount. Um, we had other people who were, you know, I mean, carrying all these other kind of identity documents with them. But it's, um, I think it's quite important to kind of remember the ADM kind of enters into these sort of relationships. And that kind of bring in interesting ways, but it really brings me actually to the biggest sort of transformation for most of the migrants that, you know, I've worked with both um, in that region, but in other places, and that's really the smartphone. The smartphone is really, if you think about, you know, how to actually most migrants access and engage with automated decision-making systems, processes, agencies, whatever we want, and there's a raft of really, you know, really useful things that have been developed to, to engage with them. It is really through the smartphone. So all those questions about access and, and networks and SIM cards and things like that are really important. Um, and we see a lot of kind of transformation, I think, you know, over the past decade, and I think there's been a lot of work in the, the EU in particular with Syrian migrants and things like that moving in um, to Europe. You know, we, we really see what a central um, object something like the mobile phone or the smartphone really has become. I mean, it's the object that people use to stay in touch with their family. It's the object that people use to watch and look for information, YouTube, etc. cetera. Um, lots of stories about people using um, uh, it for translation, using Google Translate, you know, using apps, things like that to kind of get them better access to information. Um, um, there's lots of things around kind of information, sharing information among migrant communities, NGOs sharing information with migrant communities, obviously, you know, concerns about things like misinformation. We have, there's a lot of evidence in the kind of smartphone and migration literature on using things like Google Maps, um, both to map where people are going, but also to determine where to go. So keeping that kind of real-time information, I'm thinking particularly for um, refugees and asylum seekers that this is particularly important, but you also see it at various levels for kind of more economic migrants and things like that they are moving. Um, and then a huge raft of work has been focused on the kind of use of mobile phones for, you know, recording, taking photos, recording audio messages, video messages, etc. And, you know, even in the most extreme cases, those sorts of, um, you know, there's, there's lots of stories of, um, smartphones being used in refugee and detention camps to take pictures of abuses and those being used in testimonials, et cetera. So it's become a quite seminal device that is important, but also, you know, it makes people quite vulnerable. If they lose this sort of device, they lose their networks, their connections. So we see a lot of examples in other places of, um, um, you know, actually governance, shutting down towers in particular regions to cut off information between migrants, et cetera. So these are the kinds of things that I think play out there. And I think for many of the, in the literature at least, the mobile phone and the smartphone has been really a kind of source of agency for a lot of migrants to, you know, on the one hand, it, they are vulnerable. They're people who can trace their data. Their, you know, agents can ask them to produce their mobile phones and go through their mobile phones, et cetera. But it has been seen as a kind of site of agency. And I think, 
the, I guess my question that I want to leave with is as we see, um, you know, automated decision making kind of tools being used in this process, to what extent um, does this kind of previous history with technologies and things like that, how much is that disrupted by ADM? How much of the kind of black box, you know, all the things that, you know, we can't even work out how it works in Australia, you know, I mean, you have to kind of get freedom of information things. What does that do to people's relationship with technology, their sense of trust, et cetera? And so I will stop there. <laughs> so rather than having questions in discussion now, I want to move on to the, the voices on the field. Um, and the intention of their voices on the field is to draw on people working in very much at the coalface with migrants and refugees, um, with questions around visa processing. And we've had some really great presentations giving us bigger picture understanding of what's going on, um, some of the conceptual ways in which we might understand and engage critically with this. But I think the, the experience from people from the voices of the field um, is really important for us to actually go, well, what are the challenges that people within practice, practice roles in, um, and working with mig migrants and refugees, what do they face and what are the fears that they may face as ADM and automation become more and more capable? Now, I've lost my um, piece of paper with the people's bios on, the, on it, so I'm not quite sure. No, thank you. So we have three speakers uh, for this, this, this the last panel. Um, Dr. Magdalena Aras Kubis from the Red Cross and Rest Crescent Global Migration Lab. Um, and um, Magdalena is a senior research officer uh, in the Global Migration Lab. She holds a PhD in Sociology and Social Policy from the University of Sydney and has a decade of experience in leading research with migrants in the Americas, Africa, Europe and Asia Pacific. So welcome very much. Do you want to come up? Yeah. Um, we have um, Aris, Arif Hussein from the Refugee Advice and Casework Service. So Arif is a supervising senior solicitor in, in RACS in Sydney where he has been the centre's policy and advocacy work and the centre's judicial review referral service. He has spent over seven years working with refugees and people seeking asylum both in Australia and in Australia's regional processing centre in Manus Island and Papua New Guinea. And lastly we have Nicole Batch who also from the Red Cross Australia but in the Migration Settlement Services. So Nick, Nick Batch is the head of the Migration Support Program at, the, you know, at uh, Red Cross Australia. She's a social worker and has a long history of working in Red Cross and with refugees and migrants. So welcome you all. And I think um, I'll start with you, Magdalena. Do you want to stand, stand here? Um, hi everyone and thanks Paul and Ivana for the invitation. Um, I've been asked to reflect from our practitioner's perspective on the um, use of and effects of ADM, but I think I have to start with a disclaimer that um, at the Red Cross Global Migration, Red Cross Red Cross and Global Migration Lab, we actually have um, my, a research and policy focus, so I actually don't have a client facing role. And while we're hosted by Australian Red Cross and we work really close with Nick Batch and colleagues at the Migration Support Programs, most of our work is actually with other components of the International Red Cross Red Crescent Movement. So we work really closely um, with colleagues working with migrants in vulnerable situations in other countries and regions of the world. So my perspective is quite influenced by what's happening um, in those places. I want to start by acknowledging that as all of you have said, the use of ADM and new technologies is the new reality of immigration, asylum, and border management. But that as humanitarians, it's a topic we do not know enough about, and it's a topic that we really need to know more about. We need to know how the technologies work, what the limitations are, and how they are regulated, if at all, which after hearing you, I have more doubts. <laughs> Which leads me, I, may, I guess, to a second disclaimer that I am from a migrant background and I work with humanitarians, so maybe I have less of a positive outlook, but I'm hopeful to be pleasantly surprised in the future by technology. And of course, these technologies have the potential to make the work of humanitarians more efficient, that allows us to move from reactive to more anticipatory approaches, and there are so many 
initiatives that are exciting. So there's chatbots that provide information, timely and accurate information to migrants in language that we didn't have before. And there's also the development, for instance, of forecasting tools to predict displacement and allow us to be better prepared to respond to those displacements when they happen. However, when you ask me about the impact of ADM on migrants in vulnerable situations, I don't think of humanitarian innovations per se, but I think of control. And I think in particular of the impact of new technologies on migrants in vulnerable situations through the increasing securitization of migration. Because that's where I hear mostly from colleagues working in other regions of the world. So as you all know, as Louis said, um, all aspects of the border are somehow controlled by technologies. From the physical borders, the frontiers, to how applications for asylum are processed, applications for citizenship are processed, how documents are verified. Uh, there's now tools to recognize the speech. There's tools to prove where the accent of somebody comes from. There are tools to assess risk. There are tools to extract mobile data. There are tools to electronically monitor the movement of migrants. And while some of these technologies have the potential to make decision-making more efficient and faster, which we need, because some application processes are too long for people in vulnerable situations, they also raise significant risks when you're talking about people who are already vulnerable and in need of protection. So as my colleagues mentioned, issues of discrimination, bias, and even machine errors. So for instance, when I think about some of these tools, when I think, for instance, about the electronic monitoring of migrants, which is used in some countries and in some regions as an alternative to detention, to me that is just the extension of the logic and practice of treating migrants as criminals. And when I hear about the extraction of mobile data from migrants, it raises some serious questions about privacy, about meaningful consent, and also about the adoption of measures that wouldn't be used for others, but are now used for migrants in vulnerable situations in the name of national security and migration management. So, okay. thank you. With this in mind, I think new technologies and ADM are of concern. Like we need to know more of it as humanitarians for three main reasons. One of them, of course, is that new technologies are impacting migrants in vulnerable situations, and they have the potential to create or to reinforce existing humanitarian needs. And I think a good way of approaching this from a humanitarian lens is to think of the imperative of no, doing no harm. So whether new technologies might be creating new harms, new risks for people who are already vulnerable. So when you think about applications to process visas or to process asylum claims, whether a technical glitch or a bias might mean that somebody might lose access to essential services. Or whether a security breach might mean that the data of people who are seeking protection, and data that can be quite sensitive, goes to the public domain or goes in the wrong hands. Aside from the impact of technologies in creating or reinforcing humanitarian needs, I think the second one is how ADM and new technologies might create or reinforce an environment of fear, surveillance, surveillance and mistrust amongst people who are already vulnerable. And the mistrust here, and this is our concern, is not only against governments, but is against others. So last year, for instance, we did a large survey across 15 countries. And one of the main things we found was that 25%, yeah, so around one quarter of migrants in all of those countries associated seeking humanitarian assistance and protection with the risk of being detained or deported. So in many ways that there were doubts about the independence of humanitarian organizations, that there were doubts whether seeking help would put them at risk. And when you think of an environment that is increasingly securitized, that raises serious questions for us. How do we guarantee to migrants and how we inform to migrants, for instance, that the data they share with us will not be used for non-humanitarian purposes? And I guess this brings me to the third issue, which is a question of knowledge and just how little we actually know and understand about automatic decision-making. And I'm glad to hear 
you talk about how much secrecy there is, how lack of transparency there is, and how, I would say even from my perspective, there's, we need more digital literacy to understand this better. But the more I thought about it, as I was thinking about ADM, as I was thinking about migrants in vulnerable situations, for humanitarian organizations to effectively advocate for migrants, to effectively provide services, and to retrain, to retain the trust of migrants, we need to be able to understand how these technologies work. We need to be able to understand the risks or the harms they create. We also need to understand the potential benefits they might have for us. If they are able to assist us in providing better assistance and protection or reducing humanitarian needs. But more broadly, I think we really need to have a better and clearer understanding, more accessible information about the risks and the harms they might create. And some fundamental questions like who owns the data, where is the data, questions of consent, questions of privacy. And I think that's where the center and some of you are so amazing because you have that expertise and we actually need that knowledge to do our work. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, our next speaker from the Voices from the Field is Arif, Arif Hussain. So, Arif, uh, you, uh, over to you. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Paul, um, for the invitation to speak here. I think uh, from RAC's perspective, so we are an organization, the Refugee Advice and Casework Service is an organization that assists refugees and people seeking asylum. Um, in Australia, and in terms of use of um, ADM um, in this area, I think we need to uh, contextualize the issue um, and the underlying uh, issues that relate to treatment of refugees and people seeking asylum in Australia. Um, I think, as many people are aware, in Australia there has been um, a narrative and a rhetoric over the last 20 years around uh, border protection um, and um, um, border sovereignty and protection given a priority. And in that context, um, government have used different um, different tactics, whether it's legislation, policy, or the media to ensure that people who are seeking asylum in Australia do not get to our shore. Um, and um, the rhetoric in the last 20, 20 years, and especially in the last 15 years, um, have generated some truths around refugees and people seeking asylum. And that includes that refugees and people seeking asylum are illegal, they're queue jumpers, their risk to national security. And all this is uh, shrouded in secrecy. So we, you know, I remember specifically um, when Operation Sovereign Borders started that when uh, press conferences were given and people were asking questions around, journalists were asking questions around boat turnbacks, for example, um, the immigration minister at the time would say that things are on water issues and they can't be discussed. So there's a lot of secrecy in this area. But the main point I'm trying to make here is that um, the truths that we have in Australia that have been embedded um, in society um, also form the institutional narrative around uh, refugees and people seeking asylum. So by that, I mean uh, the narrative that exists within the department. Um, so when we, we we discuss this, it's not just hypothetical. Um, when um, when Operation Sovereign Borders initially started, there was directives within the department um, provided by the immigration minister to refer to people as illegal arrivals uh, um, and to refer to people as detainees, but previously they were referred to as clients. So if we are operating with the, within this context already where refugees and people seeking asylum are dehumanized, um, they're 
there there are unwelcoming rules that they return back to where they come from and based on the slides that i've seen and in our experience there's in terms of uh, processing of visitor visas there's already pre-arrival screening of people um so the, the the issue for us the thought of use of uh, adm in this area is scary because it can have a negative consequence in terms of um, access to uh, asylum and uh, the ability of people to seek asylum in Australia. Um, I think in terms of um, in terms of uh, the allure of um, ADM in this space, it's clear, you know, as a, as a service delivery provider racks, um, the efficiency, um, you know, the maybe possibly the consistency and um, or increased uh, consider consistency and the ability for ADM to possibly address some biases. Um, it may create some benefits, but the potential, given the context within which we operate in, for it to be used in a negative way to prevent people from accessing their rights um, and understanding their rights is, is a greater threat than the benefit from uh, my perspective working in this field for a while. Um, I think that is also underpinned by the experiences of people seeking asylum you know there's a lot of talk and there was a lot of discussion here around the legal framework um, standards uh, but um, not so much around the experiences the lived experiences of people seeking asylum people seeking asylum um, in australia and likely globally they face significant barriers in accessing um, uh, and understanding their legal rights. These barriers include cultural, linguistic, and socioeconomic. They are compounded by the way that we treat people seeking asylum. You know, as an example, in Australia, you know, for a long time, we haven't had any government-funded uh, uh, legal aid for people seeking asylum through the RSC process. So that is also uh, a big factor in, in that context of dehumanizing and then uh, whether in that context of dehumanizing and refugees facing significant barriers in understanding and accessing the, their legal rights, whether ADMs could play a uh, positive role. And from our experience, it's unlikely. Um, I think um, where we've seen, and, and this is borne out in terms of our experience, where we've seen the use of algorithms, it, it, has, it has meant that people, people's rights have been um, undermined. So, for example, in Australia, um, it's been highlighted by the Australian Human Rights Commission. Um, within the Immigration Detention Network, there is the Security Risk Assessment Tool, uh, which uses some form of algorithm to determine the risk that a person detained in immigration detention, um, their risk criteria, essentially. And then their risk criteria determines whether they're ha handcuffed to medical appointments, to external appointments, and when they moved around the detention network, how they're treated. And this, there's been very limited oversight on this. Uh, when people have tried to FOI the code source of that algorithm, it's been denied as far as I know, last I looked. Um, and and the, the use of this um, impacts people's ability in detention. Um, the other issues discussed briefly was the use of data, for example. Um, and this again highlights how disadvantaged refugees and people seeking asylum are in this process, in this discussion. Um, in 2014, the Department of Immigration released the data or inf personal information of uh, people held in immigration detention in February at a specific time, but provided very little recourse around that. And there was very little recourse uh, available to people um, whose data was uh, released um, um, on the department's website. 
so those are the the risks uh, associated with it, I think. And in terms of just the RSD process, I think, um, and there was issues around um, that was discussed already. You know, uh, ADM entrenching um discrimination biases um in rsd a big part of the refugee status determination is like credibility consistency but um if the institution narrative is that refugees um uh, 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 if the institutional narratives are uh, framed against refugees then um, ADM has the potential to compound those negative narratives, right? And the negative um, biases that we hold already. And it's possible that, and that, um, you know, like when it comes to issues of credibility in practice, decision makers at the moment look at demeanor, look at eye contact and look at, um, consistency of information provided to the Deba Department of Immigration, in this case, uh, over a period of time. And different people from different cultural backgrounds have um, expressed their emotions different way, and that could be interpreted in, in various ways by decision makers. And bringing ADM in that um, without any oversight, without uh, any, uh, you know, perspectives from people with lived experience um, and without a human rights framework uh, centered around it, um, it has uh, a real consequence in the refugee and asylum processes because at the end of the day, the outcome you get from a refugee status determination determines whether you are allowed to um, start your life in a safe country such as Australia or be deported to harm or possibly death or serious risk of harm. So that was um, all at the moment. And I have to say that I have to leave sharp on five. Thank you. And um, last, we've got Nicole Batch or Nick. Um, please uh, thank you for joining us from Red Cross Australia in the Migration Services. So, Nick, um, what's your reflections from your the area of the world? Yeah, great. Thanks, Paul. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I'm just joining from the Wurundjeri land, so add my acknowledgement to yours at the beginning. Um, my contribution to this conversation is not based on visa processing decisions, but uh, even though I'm uh, fascinated by the conversation so far and uh, aware of the alarming um, trends happening there, but I guess uh, our experience in service delivery is what I bring to the discussion. And what looms large for me are the trade-offs with which we're confronted between a desire for possibly a more libertarian approach where people have autonomy over their own data and control of how it gets used and the benefits of having some protections for vulnerable people who may not yet have the capacity at a period of vulnerability or might be in such a circumstance of desperation that they don't have the ability to provide genuine consent about the use of their data. So I think uh, that balance between trying to find social policy that helps us develop ethical frameworks and good levels of governance for ADM, I guess the question I keep coming back to is whether indeed there can ever be the right balance found. For operational agencies like ours at Red Cross, where we have a humanitarian mandate, the imperative of responsibility to use our limited resources effectively to respond to needs and deliver services and have the greatest impact is, of course, underpinned by the commitment to do no harm in that process. And I'd like to share two brief examples, given the time, I'll try to be quite brief, um, based on our operational experience. One is an example of where ADM is being used for online screening in emergency relief services provision within our migration support programs and the other relates to our ongoing journey around use of data for matching purposes in our work of tracing missing family members who have been separated as a result of conflict, disaster and migration. 
So the first example goes back to April 2020 and uh, COVID was kicking in and we had to scale up our emergency relief program in order to support people who were temporary visa holders or without visas who weren't eligible for any other supports that others in Australia were able to access. So we received funding support from both federal agencies and some state governments as well. And we had to really uh, increase our ability to get emergency relief payments out to people. So with that uh, increase, increased scale and demand, we established a portal for applications which enabled people to apply for emergency relief support from wherever they were, from home if they were in lockdown. Um, and between April 2020 and December 2021, we were able to distribute just over $18.5 million to um, vulnerable asylum, people on temporary visas in Australia. And so we assisted over 108,000 people and they were across 152 different nationalities. So that included international students as well. And I'm sure for those in Australia, the experience of lockdown and, and uh, the impact on international students will be well remembered. So, you know, just meeting basic needs was a real struggle. People lost their jobs and access to income support. So um, that was a really important process for us to be able to screen a high volume of applications quickly and provide a dignified way of providing people with support. We've had feedback from clients in the past that having cash assistance rather than vouchers is much more dignified and it's their preference. So we were pleased to be able to do that. At our height of our operations, we were receiving over 8,000 applications a week through our portal. And we've continued to evolve since then. The COVID emergency relief payments have stopped, thankfully. Uh, we now have a smaller scale safety net program. And another thing that came out of that COVID emergency relief was the need that we identified for uh, a pilot that has been supported by the Department of Social Services for a family and domestic violence pilot where we're supporting people who uh, are on temporary visas, but who are trying to leave um, family and domestic violence. So again, we're still using that portal to assist people to quickly access emergency relief funds and usually we do that within 48 hours of people applying for assistance so it's been a really positive example I think of how we've been able to deliver services to migrants who are in need. The second example I'll speak with uh, about is just um, really about the, the ongoing journey we have within the Red Cross Red Crescent movement in tracing missing family members. We operate as a global network for people who have lost contact with their family members as a result of disaster, conflict or migration. And as you can imagine, that in involves us collecting a lot of information about people and it's traditionally been quite a labour intensive search that is required. We've been on a journey for a couple of years now to try to use data more effectively and quickly to try to find people um, faster and one tool that was developed a couple of years ago and we're still refining and, and continuing to improve is called Trace the Face which is an online tracing tool where people search for family members and register with us and upload their photo so hopefully a relative will be able to see them and identify them and we can help put them back in contact. Now there's a number of protections that were built into that system to make sure that data is safely looked after, that people don't have access to information about minors unless they're going through a Red Cross or Red Crescent staff member and there's a, a lot we've learned from in terms of managing this level of data including moving into digital matching that we're still developing. So those uh, practices that we've developed during this period is really making sure um, that we've got the da data governance processes in place at the global level because we're exchanging information globally to make sure that we do it safely. So I guess my, my final comment uh, is just my concern about the gap in, in knowledge between practitioners who are working in the human services field and the, uh, the gap between them and what technological solutions might be available. So it's not just a gap, it's a chasm. And I can't emphasize strongly enough that we need people who can act as interpreters from these different fields to help us traverse this chasm and help us make sure we have reliable oversight mechanisms, make good decisions and develop ethical tools for the way we deliver our services and make sure that we can continue to support vulnerable people um, and that they can turn to organisations that they can trust when they need it most. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Paul. Um, we're, we're in a bit of a darkness um, and I know it's gone five o'clock and we start a little bit late and so I hope our audience is out online and in person is able to stay for a few more minutes at least to have, to, to have a discussion. Um, 
uh, I actually wanted to begin by with Nicole's uh, next comments. Is like we started off looking at all the ways in which governments are using ADM in a very destructive and, and uh, re re controlling and reducing of rights um, way, um, and then we ended up with thinking about. Well, actually, sometimes we can't control what governments are doing, but can we actually use technologies outside in a, in a positive way as well to supplement um, our head banging against governments to say that they can do better? Now, one of the things I guess we, I wanted to do with this discussion is just to say, well, what are the lessons here and where should we be going? Because as a centre of excellence with a multidisciplinary research team and 250 researchers, we should be able to ha work together with migration services and people doing research in this space to actually say, how can we progress this? And so I'd like to, uh, to invite anyone from our audiences um, online or in person to actually say, well, what are, what are some reflections do you see here or some observations that uh, we should be putting our attention into um, either in a, as a research base or as a training base, which you also uh, talked about, Nick, um, but also uh, uh, community um, involvement, um, translational activities, etc. So I'll open up the floor to any comments or any questions that you wanted to raise for clarification. So have you got, um, do we able to put the lights on at all? Is that possible? Is that Okay. So if you could just say who you are, introduce yourself, and then who you're going to address the question to. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I'm Abdul from the uh, Queensland University of Technology, and I don't uh, address this question to anyone in particular. I wanted to address it to the whole panel, but it comes from a uh, provocation off of what Daniel said earlier about um, <clears throat> private corporations and how um, the development of technologies uh, for the purpose of defense, um, it's actually quite a lucrative industry. Um, my question's in relation to that, when we have um, lucrative industries, trade secrets become something that are quite prominent and uh, corporations that are developing ADM solutions um, for the purpose of defense aren't um, readily um, uh, open to the idea of, of making these technologies uh, available for public scrutiny. Um, I can imagine that obviously there'd be frameworks in place and agreements in place to ensure that um, governments do, um, you know, just with respect to their own relationships with these corporations, uh, you know, get access to these technologies. But how often do we see independent reviews of these technologies to evaluate their fidelity? Um, and is this something that is done routinely or is this something that actually has to be uh, provoked? Any, any of our um, panellists, would you like to come up here and, and also that way you can see any responses? Is it How are we going? Better? Yep. Uh, in terms of ADM at the border, which is the only uh, form of ADM in this space that I have any knowledge over, uh, the answer, as far as I'm concerned, is pretty much never. <laughs> there's been a few instances I can think of where there's been such public outrage about a proposed system that it has been the merits of it and the, the effective no effectiveness of it has been reviewed and it's been scrapped. One prominent example is the iBorder control system that was uh, potentially going to be rolled out in the EU, which was a pretty amazing system because it involved people being forced to sit down and talk to an on-screen avatar that would then assess their face for uh, biomarkers of deceit, <laughs> little facial expressions, and it just didn't function well and it was so unpopular that it never got out of testing phase. However, it was maybe something that was never going to go ahead and pretty much all of the ADM processes behind it are already integrated into other EU systems. And the final thing I'd say is what has definitely been noticed 
is governments using the spreading of the bordering assemblage increasingly across a public-private divide as a technique to obscure the process from public scrutiny and claim commercial incompetence over aspects of sovereign state bordering, which is our government producing our political community and we have a right to have a greater knowledge of. So that is definitely a concern. And the final thing I'd say as well, sorry, is that an interesting thing about the same public companies being involved in the development of ADM in different sovereign contexts is that they're using similar risk profiles and similar systems. So we're seeing a conflation in the way bordering is done in different parts of the world because the same corporations are developing bordering systems for the EU and Australia and the US, particularly across the Five Eyes network as well. There's common companies involved. Just add one, one quick thing. Um, it's a really, really important question, and I think in the, it's around that transparency issue. This like trade secrets has been such a barrier, um, but in terms of like ways forward, I mean, obviously the preferable thing would be just to, if you have a regulation that says it has to be public. Yeah, I mean that's that's the e easiest way to, to deal with that. Uh, companies would hate it, governments would hate it, and probably won't do it. But I mean, that, if that's what's required, that's what you have to do. A, a middle ground is. Uh, having some sort of national, like legislative national watchdog, that can look at incompetence, and you know, it's it's it's, char it's tasked with a, with reviewing all all algor algorithmic systems or ADM systems used by the government, whether developed by private companies or by the government themselves. And if there's trade secrets involved, fine. If they're an independent body, they can review it in, in private. And so there are proposals to that effect, both before by the Australian Human Rights Commission here about a new. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the title is, but a new commissioner focused on um, on fairness in, in AI decision making, um, and also the, the final slide I didn't get to from the robo debt inquiry also suggests having some sort of independent body set up to carry out that sort of scrutiny. Any other comments from our, um, our online um, participant uh, panelists would like to comment? No. Um, any other questions from the audience? Sarah. So it's a comment as well as a question. Yeah, I think that the way this kind of sets of concerns are configuring and they're resonating across the different people who've spoken is, is really, it's very striking, but it's also not surprising. You know, these are the sets of concerns that we, we know that we should have, right? So I suppose for me, the question is, um, it's not all, you know, can necessarily answer, but the question is how do we actually develop research and intervention strategies that are preemptive rather than just investigate, investigation, um, or, that, um, or that are responsive? So how do we actually get into a preemptive mode rather than a responsive mode? How do we actually kind of take forward a strategy that, that, makes, that works towards how do we make things go right rather than trying to stop things from going wrong? Um, I know there's not necessarily a direct answer to that, but there are existing examples like RoboDebt, which has been mentioned so many times in case in which you can learn from. I mean, this is something that's big in our work, but we'd be talking to migrants and integrating the lived experience of migrants in the design of projects. So the fears that they have, the doubts that they have, and how that could inform the topic that we should be addressing and then how we return that information effectively to them because it's as providers and as humanitarians we're struggling without the knowledge I can't imagine as someone who just arrived in Australia that has no university degree in Australia cannot read or write full in English then what those doubts and fears are so for me it would be somehow including migrants in the conversation and addressing those fears and doubts that already are and that I think will only get worse given the trends that we see. So that's how I would be anticipatory, that those fears are already there for a reason, and I don't think we'll go in the right direction unless somehow we push for it. Yeah, and I think we, we, we were talking about before we started, and this idea of you know, engaging in strategic foresight work and actually doing the work and imagining the possible futures and trying to engineer the ones that we want because we're, we're so reactive as we like there's so much bad stuff going on right now everyone's focused on like the worst thing that's happening right now but the worst thing that might be happening in 10 years could be so much worse than what's happening now and unless we start thinking about what that could be 
uh, or what better futures could be, we're not going to be able to, to, to change what's happening. Um, I think both of those are wonderful answers. And the only thing I'd add as well is that we can come up with some pretty core principles about these systems right now. And I think we, you know, having um, the voices of people who are impacted by them involved in the conversation, having proper legal frameworks and protections in place. And I'd add to that, because there's nothing wrong with a bit of social theory or philosophy, is um, Louisa Moore's book, Cloud Ethics, which is such a good book about algorithms and how we should understand algorithms, makes a fundamental point that one of the biggest problems with so many algorithmic systems is the discourse around them being objective and neutral. If you just pull away that discourse and treat every decision by an algorithmic system as an aperture on the world, as a partial decision, and you, if you embed that discourse into something like ADM at the border, then that changes everything. Um, and so I think it's all about how it's embedded into the assemblage that it's part of. And we can think of core principles to do that embedding work in a much better way. Any comments from online? No? All good. Um, any other questions that we have from the floor? This, do you want to say anything? Even you've been working in the Humanitech Red Cross uh, Nexus. Um, so thank you so much for uh, you know all of your perspectives. They were, they were very um, informative. I think uh, one of the questions that I had, and I've been tackling this as well, is um, looking at the role of um, how we can better translate knowledge from either side. So both from the humanitarian side and people that are working on that side, as well as um, from the government and regulation side. So do you have any thoughts of what possible directions might we take to um, create better avenues for um, interpretation and translation work? This is something I have struggled with transitioning from academia to the Red Cross Red Crescent world. But I think one of the main things is to be aware that there's a massive eagerness for knowledge People want to know about these issues and they're happy to commit the time, they're happy to engage in research, they're happy to come to seminars, but the knowledge has to be really accessible and not put more work on them because most of our colleagues are already doing an amazing amount of work on the very difficult conditions. So we have to provide a knowledge that is accessible and that has practical implications. So I know the conceptual aspect of it, the theory, the social critique is very important, but we have to be able to distill, I think that's the word, the key messages for them and what that means in practice and how they use those key concepts when they work with migrants. So for instance, I think what Daniel was saying about thinking about lawfulness, fairness, transparency and accountability, that would be a concern that many people in the field would have. But the question is, well, how does that actually look in practice and how do you respond to a migrant that has had a negative decision based on the case or a migrant that has been racially profiled? So kind of that aspect of translation, that is time consuming on us because we have to spend more time writing and rewriting and revising complex things into simple key messages that I think is doable. Okay. Any comments from online? Um, uh, maybe so Aris and Nick have had to send their apologies and said thank you for having them, but they've had to head off. Sorry? Arif and Nick have said just have sent their apologies and said thank okay. you for having them, but they've had to move to another meeting. Thank you. Um, uh, before I know we're just keeping people from from their reception for the the, the pre so pre symposium reception. So I just thought I'd want to ask one more, that last question. I think um, Daniel, you were talking a lot about administrative justice, um, and that really came up in RoboDebt where. RoboDebt was making a decision about whether people had a debt or not, and then that, that is a very appellable and reviewable decision. Um, and, you, and also talking about whether we award a visa or not based on circumstances it is an appellable, reviewable decision. But a lot of the examples that people used are not like profiling of people through borders, etc. They are just administrative decisions. And, uh, and this is something in my own area in social services, other areas of social services, there we actually don't seem to have any capacity to engage with those. Comparison to the, like the European Union, 
um, where we do have human, the Human Rights Act, which is able to look at those bigger questions. Do you see any possibilities for legal de developments to try to, or, or processes or regulatory uh, frameworks that we could put in place to make sure that those non, that the use of automation in those non-reviewable places give greater, much more fluidity and, and more procedural justice as well? That's a really great question, and, and, and definitely. And so that sort of features in a lot of the proposals that are being considered now um, in this idea of having a, a watchdog of some sort, whether it's in the Australian Human Rights Commission or otherwise, would be able to review and to issue binding findings about any, any, any algorithms or automated decision-making systems that are being used. Um, but it's just the first step is transparency. Like, we need to know what's happening and we need to know how those decisions are being made. And uh, you know, without that, there, there's absolutely no accountability. <laughs> um, and I think one of the really difficult things with this, and I suppose this is where we start to enter the debate about to what extent is transparency possible? Because even in the EU where there are listed categories that get used to create the risk profiles, and there are express exclusions, so race, ethnicity, sexuality can't be used to create profiles. Um, a lot of people say the algorithm's smart enough to create, uh, to assess race and ethnicity using proxy profiles that it will develop in its own right. So I totally agree that there needs to be legal structures to allow people to, re to review decisions and to try and get as close to transparency as possible. But we also need to acknowledge that complete transparency will never be possible. And I suppose that's where I come back to Louisa Moore because <laughs> she says the way around that is in all well, the way to move forward there is to then focus on how we understand the decision. If complete transparency is never possible, then we need to understand the algorithmic decision the same way we understand the human decision. It's always flavored by bias. It's always an interpretation. And when that discourse is the preeminent discourse, as opposed to algorithmic objectivity and neutrality, then that influences how you create your legal structures. If the algorithmic decision is always biased, then you can never have a robo debt. You can never have a situation where that's the final word. There always has to be a way to say, what's another interpretation of this person's risk score? It's just one aperture, we need another one as well. Thank you very much. Um, it's a bit of a tangential, a tangential point, but one that just kind of came, came out from some of my reflections on some of the other interventions. I think the, the and I'd start off by saying that I was a sort of tech, techno, techno optimist, but I, I think, I mean, that's not to downplay the, like, the real, real risks that are at play here. Um, and I think the, the trend, both in Australia and internationally, the really worrying trend has been that the testing ground for these technologies is always the most vulnerable people. You saw like welfare recipients in Australia, people crossing borders. If you're gonna try and test these systems, you know, start with the significant investor visas, automate that. I mean, they, they, they'll have the resources to be able to, to challenge it and, and make it work. I think at the very, very last step is you know, the, the people who are most vulnerable and have the most at stake. And it go, goes back to that question, you know, what decisions are appropriate to be automated and which ones aren't and th those are the considerations to take into account when answering that question. Thank you very much and I think that's a really important place to end. Um, so thank you uh, to all of our panellists. Can you join me in thanking uh, our panellists for a wonderful and really stimulating um, problematic in terms of like concerning but also hopeful session. So thank you very much for you all.